Welcome back to the second episode of Emotion Ocean Talks on the Red Sea. In the first episode, I focused mainly on geography and geology of the Red Sea, while today I want to talk a little bit more about the bioclimatic factors of this sea. The narrowest point and also the most shallow point when we consider the whole width of the sea is here again at the Bab al Mandab. This is only 26 kilometers or 16 miles wide and 130 meters or 426 feet deep. You can imagine if we have there such a bottleneck, there's only very little exchange of water possible, very little inflow of water from the Indian Ocean and very little outflow from the Red Sea. When we just consider the surface water of the Red Sea, the top 200 meter water layer, it takes six years for that to exchange with the Indian Ocean. And when we consider the complete water mass, the complete water body of the Red Sea, it even takes 200 years for a complete exchange. The Red Sea is located in one of the hottest areas of the world. So we have extremely high temperatures, we have almost no rainfall, there are strong winds because this Red Sea is in the influence of the uh, northeastern as west as the southwesternly monsoon. All of those are factors which increase evaporation. We have a high evaporation here leading to hot, extremely salty water while most of the seawater of the world has about 3.5% of salt dissolved in it, in the Red Sea it is up to 4.2%. The surface temperatures of the Red Sea vary north, south, summer, winter, between 22 and 30 degrees Celsius, which is 71 to 86 degrees Fahrenheit. You know that the water gets colder the deeper we come in a lake, in a sea, in an ocean. All of you probably experienced that. But water, when we look at it in bigger proportions, does not cool down gradually. But we have layers of water above or on top of each other. So we have a surface water layer of warm water underneath the cooler middle water body underneath depending on the depths, depending on the situations, yet colder deep sea water. The surface area, the surface layer in the Red Sea is about 200 to 300 meter deep. And the layer where that one with the cooler underlying layer meets, which is called the thermocline, is accordingly between two and three hundred meters. Below the thermocline in the Red Sea we have very stable water temperatures of about 21 to 22 degrees Celsius which is extremely warm for that depth. Those temperatures translate to 70 to 71 degree Fahrenheit. In the Red Sea there are no strong currents all the currents that we have are spatially and temporally variable and basically all of them are wind driven. In summer there is a predominant north-south wind and thus we have a predominant north-south current. In winter it's the opposite direction and due to that in winter the influence of the colder water of the Indian Ocean that comes through the Bab al Mandab will come further into the Red Sea than in summer. And also in generally, this connection here to the colder waters of the Gulf of Aden to the Indian Ocean actually leads to colder surface waters or colder waters altogether here in the southern part of the Red Sea, although the outside temperature, the air temperatures, might be hotter there than further up in the middle regions of the Red Sea or the north. Here at the Bab al Mandab, I said that the sea floor is only 130 meter below the water surface, the sea surface. So here is a barrier in the sea floor which is 
in on the side of the Gulf of Aden as well as on the Red Sea side much deeper and that causing here where currents are coming in from the Indian Ocean in the depth that this water wells up at this barrier and brings cold water from the depth close to the surface into those top 200 meters and this is only 130 meters deep. So here we have water temperatures of sometimes only 16 degrees Celsius. And that is too cold for quite a number of organisms which live either here in the warmer waters of the Gulf um, of Aden or in the Red Sea, not allowing all the fish and all the other organisms to exchange through the Bab al-Mandab. But still, there is a lot of life in the Red Sea, as in the Indian Ocean. It just differs sometimes. Not everything that we find here will be found in the Red Sea and vice versa. Altogether, there are at the moment more than 200 species of corals known from the Red Sea, soft as well as hard corals. There are more than 1,000 invertebrates known. To the invertebrates belong octopus, worms, sea cucumbers, sea stars, sea urchins, and whatever else. And then obviously there are fish. There are more than 1,200 species of fish who live in the Red Sea. And out of those 1,200, more than 120, so more than 10%, live exclusively in the Red Sea. So they belong to the ones who do not move into the Gulf of Aden and further out. out. Most of these fish and other organisms live along the shores because here we have 2,000 kilometers of coral reefs along the shores of Eritrea, Sudan, Egypt, Israel and Saudi Arabia. Another important habitat of the Red Sea are actually mangrove forests or mangrove thickets. There aren't that many mangroves along the shores of the Red Sea, but there are some and they are very important as kindergarten for many species. Some of those might be animals who move later on when they are grown a little bit more into the coral reefs. Others move out into the open water because they are pelagic species. But even for the pelagic fish and pelagic organisms, to which also dolphins belong, to which belong manta rays, and, 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 also for them, the basis of life, the food sources, lie in the coral reefs. The coral reefs are life in the Red Sea. Without them, the Red Sea will die. But unfortunately, the coral reefs of the Red Sea are tremendously threatened by a lot of different reasons. One are the 20 to 35,000 oil tankers which move through the Red Sea toward the Mediterranean Sea every year. They leak oil, they spill oil. Then there are more than 1 million tourists per year and not all of them are ecotourists. There's a lot of unpurified sewage. There are, so that humans have water to drink, desalination plants which exhaust hot brine and chemicals into the Red Sea. Other industrial plants use the water from the Red Sea for their cooling systems and thus reintroduce hot water. The wind blows fertilizers and cement dust, to only mention two ingredients, into the water. There's a lot of fishery on one hand for food, on the other hand for aquariums. And nowadays, more and more aquaculture plants, shrimp farms, oyster farms, are in the Red Sea. Several governmental and non-governmental attempts exist on small to huge scale in order to protect the Red Sea and its ecosystem. But still, it is a very fragile ecosystem and not enough is done to protect it. I hope you learned something new about the Red Sea and that you will join me again for another episode of Emotion Ocean Talks.